Hello, my name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to Byline Radio and the Byline Times podcast. If you're listening on Catch Up today, the response to Putin's war crimes, Russia's invading army has previously shelled civilian shelters and a maternity hospital in Mariupol. Now, mass graves have been discovered in the town of Bukhar following the retreat of Russian troops. Corpses were found with hands tied behind their backs. Ukraine's President Zelensky called for Russia's expulsion from the UN Security Council today, describing their crimes as the most terrible we have seen since World War II. So what should the West do in response? How much personal responsibility does Putin bear for what is going on? We'll hear shortly from Inna Sovson. She's a Ukrainian MP, deputy head of the opposition Golos Zhmin party. She was a minister for education and science between 2014 and 2016. Plus Peter Dukes, who is the executive editor of the Byline Times. Before we get cracking, just a reminder that Byline Radio and the Byline Times podcast come from the Byline Times and we are funded by ordinary people like you. There are no oligarchs or corporate interests telling us what to say so we can report without fear and without favour. And indeed, we do. So that's where we're coming from. If you can get a few quid together to maybe support us in our work, please do so. Go over to our website, bylinetimes.com, and there you can find details of how to subscribe. That's at bylinetimes.com, our brilliant news-breaking website, and that's where you'll find details of how to subscribe to the Byline Times. I want to welcome Inna Sovson to the conversation now. As I say, she is a Ukrainian MP, deputy head of the opposition Golos Zhmin party. She was a minister for education and science as well for a couple of years. Inna, welcome, um, welcome to Byline Radio. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Inna, terrible news coming out of the town of Bucha. If, if you could just give us a sense of what you're hearing and, and what sense you make of it. Well, first of all, uh, what I need to point out is that we are hearing the name Bucha a lot, but it's not only Bucha. The same crimes were seen in many, many villages around Kiev from the northwest and the west. There are smaller villages and, and the sheer number of people living there was smaller. But you have to realize that it was not only taking place in one town. It was actually taking place in many villages around Kiev, but also on the road. And, and that is the road that people were trying to escape on. And the Russians would just open fire on them uh, from, from tanks, sometimes from, from rifle. Uh, that, that is what they were doing all over the area that they have taken under their control. And it's important to understand that because we have to realize that this is their strategy of how to take control over a territory. And right now, as we speak, they are holding large territories all over Ukraine. And, and probably the most scary thought right now is that what happened in Bucha is actually happening in many other towns and villages all over Ukraine right now as we speak. And and, and that is a scary thought to begin with, but, but that is something that, that I always keep in mind. Because of course I want because of course I'm terrified with what happened in Bucha and in other villages around Kiev. But I'm I'm even more terrified that this keeps on happening in other parts of Ukraine on the east and on the south. And we need to stop that. And and this is this is my, my primary mission right now is to explain to everyone that this keeps on happening and we need to do everything in our power to stop this. But getting back to the issue of, of what happened in Bucha, it, it's very difficult to talk about that. I'll be honest with you. I, I can't even look at the pictures anymore. I can't look at the video anymore. I I, I just can't. It's, it's impossible to understand that – to to understand, to accept that this was happening like 20 minutes drive from my home. This was happening on the streets that I can recognize. Uh, they were shot shooting at cars on the road that I take to drive to my parents' place. They were killing people on the streets in Bucha, close to the park, where like a couple of months ago we went to uh, with my boyfriend and we had a very nice date over there. And I just looked there and it's just incomprehensible that this is actually happening. I, I I believe that everyone listening right now believes that it's impossible to imagine. But just try imagining a city that you know so well, or a small town that you went for a, you know to spend a weekend on, and seeing dead people over there. This is this is terrifying. I can't explain to what extent. Uh, and and all I want right now is first of all to stop that from happening in other towns, 
but also to bring justice uh, to the victims of those um, uh, war crimes. Absolutely. And I'm sure you're aware, you know, that people in the United Kingdom and across the rest of the world share your revulsion. And I just want to make it clear that there is no room for kind of false neutrality in this debate here. We stand in absolute solidarity with you and the Ukrainian people. I know that. And I actually have to tell you this, that, uh, of course, we, we wish for more support from the West for us right now. Uh, but we actually believe that the United Kingdom is probably the best friend we have right now because the level of support we are getting from the UK is is it's actually the biggest. Uh, we are getting uh, lots of support for our weapon, for our army. Uh, we are getting political support. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, your foreign secretary, Liz Truss, actually telling what, what other foreign ministers are afraid to say or don't feel comfortable of saying. So, so we are grateful, actually, to the people in the United Kingdom and to your leadership right now uh, who, are, who are doing that, frankly. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely honest. To tell, I'm, I'm, like, um, I'm telling you this not just because I'm talking to you right now, but because this is this general sentiment uh, in, uh, in the country right now. That's probably uh, the best friend we have uh, is the United Kingdom right now. There is absolute revulsion at the pictures that we have seen from this village that you know so well. But what's disturbing about what you have said is that you believe that this is not just one rogue unit of the Russian army, but they are using these tactics of mass slaughter as a deliberate military strategy. That is true. And uh, you have to realise, uh, I don't know to what extent people listening to this uh, know and understand the, the complexities of history uh, between Ukraine and Russia. But we did have a very complex history before that. Uh, this is not the first time that the Russians are trying to kill Ukrainians. This has been actually happening for centuries. Uh, in in 1932-33, uh, the, the, the Russians started what we call a great famine here in Ukraine, which killed uh, 10 million people here in Ukraine again. And that was a deliberate act of genocide on Ukrainian soil, targeting Ukrainians with a single reason, because they wanted to kill Ukrainians. And, and this has been happening for centuries again. The, the Russian uh, empire was not allowing us to speak Ukrainian language. Uh, Ukrainian books were being burned. Ukrainian uh, elite was being uh, was being prosecuted, sent to gulags, and and during the, the the Soviet times. But right now, we did believe that now, once we're an independent state, they would not go for that. But apparently, right now, that this historical hatred and and uh, inability of Russians to accept that Ukraine is an independent nation, right now, it also this hatred towards us. Uh, has been doubled by the fact that we have chosen a different path compared to Russia. Because no matter how imperfect uh, Ukrainian society and politics is, we still chose to be a democracy. Again, I'm, I'm representing an opposition party. I, I can, I can t talk a lot about how imperfect Ukrainian democracy is, but it is a democracy. It is a country where we elect our rulers, we elect our parliament on free elections, we elect our presidents, and that is something that Russia hasn't grown up to as of yet. And that is the, the, like this has just doubled this this hatred that I have always been feeling towards us. So that is why right now we're not just fighting in this war that has historical background, but right now we're also fighting because we chose a different path than Russia did, and they really hate us for that. And 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 they are actually using uh, like everything every arse, everything in, in their arsenal. Uh, to destroy as Ukrainians. And I don't know if you've read this, because that was probably only published in Russian, but actually it was two days from now, uh, s Saturday or Sunday, an article appeared in Russian um, uh, media called Dria Novosti, and the article was called What to do with Ukraine? And, and this is a completely Kremlin-controlled uh, source. So, so that is basically just a reflection of the Putin's and Kremlin thinking about that. Is this... Yeah, planning... Oh, hello. No. Yeah, yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah sorry. Okay. Yes, I lost you for a moment. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so uh, what they're saying is that uh, we are planning to... Well, they continue to use this term, denazify Ukraine. 
uh, whatever that means. But they're talking about sending Ukrainians to uh, different uh, like towns in uh, northern Russia uh, just to uh, re-educate us. Which sounds so terrifyingly like 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 what uh, Stalin did, you know, sending people uh, to Gulag and all. They are talking about uh, like changing the, the uh, ensuring the censorship, uh, burning the textbooks of history here in Ukraine. This is what they're describing in that book, in that article is basically the genocide of the people, and and they're speaking openly about that. So that is the second thing, and and the third one uh, is. I should be speaking in like uh, a little bit less, but sorry but for for this historical background. But the third important thing is that you have to understand this is not just Putin doing. Putin did not uh, like force those soldiers to commit uh, those terrible crimes they did. He didn't force those soldiers to rape Ukrainian women and children. Uh, they do that because they feel this hatred too. Because they are part of this of this hatred, uh, you know what what struck me a lot is um, again that was reported in the media uh, that the Russian soldiers are taking uh, have been have been stealing stuff from the houses of of uh, of people of civilians, and they were sending that uh, back home to their wives or parents. So can you imagine? There is a woman; her husband is a soldier in the Russian army. And he's calling her and telling her, "I'm going to send you a washing machine and and some uh, some stuff for the kitchen and a toaster and 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 also I've stolen I've taken some very nice uh, earrings for you." And she says, "Oh, great! I really want to have those." And this has been happening like thousands of those cases that we we understand and we see now. Can you imagine what a sick nation that is? If a woman is happy about those news about her husband just looting uh, houses of civilians. And sending her uh, stuff and clothes and all from people whom he has killed, that is just just terrifying to realize. But but you have to realize that this is not just Putin. This is actually the Russian society that is so extremely sick, and they are committing acts of genocide because they all truly hate us. Your president today, uh, the United Nations, made comparisons, not with Stalin but with the Nazis. And he said that men like von Ribbentrop, the Nazi minister of foreign affairs, did not escape prosecution for crimes in World War II. Do you think that is a, a reasonable equivalence to draw? Oh, sorry. Did you hear that? Yes. Sorry, I was, I was saying that no, 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 President I just, Zelensky... I was, just, uh, I was wondering if you heard the sound, because this sound that uh, you might have heard, I don't know if that uh, goes through. No, no, no. We got the, the air raid siren right now, so that means there that we are under airstrike again. Um, but And where, where exactly are you in? Um, where, where is, where's your situation? I'm in the western Ukraine right now. Actually, I came to see my son for mm. a couple of days, so. So, yeah, we got that here too. I mean, uh, we got used to that in, in Kiev, but uh, we also get those in uh, in Western Ukraine as well, which for me is, is more terrifying because my son is here. So, but um, yeah, well, anyways, sorry. Uh, but uh, speaking about uh, the punishment and, and uh, whether they are uh, the same as uh, Nazis were, you know, uh, I got one image stuck in my head. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was an exchange of prisoners. Uh, so, so we exchanged prisoners. So we, we gave the Russian soldiers back and they gave us uh, Ukrainian soldiers back. And among those prisoners that we got back, Ukrainian soldiers, were 15 female soldiers. And uh, I was struck with this image because all female soldiers had their hair uh, shaven. So the Russians did that to them. They have shaved. They have shaved the the, the 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 hair from women's heads, and this is just exactly what the Nazis were doing. Like like precisely, this act of of, of violence uh, against uh, uh, individuals is 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 so much from from the Nazi textbook. So yeah, that is so much what the Nazis were doing, and and uh, even on those small things like shaving the head. Uh, uh, which is terrifying in itself, and but they did that. So yes, yeah, they are the Nazis of our times, and and I know it's a scary thought. 
it's probably easy to think that this is just some local conflict, but this is actually the conflict of of uh, of, sen- of a century, uh, and uh, we hope the world will learn that uh, everyone needs to be on the right side of history in this one, uh, because they are the Nazis, so truly they are, and uh, we do hope that justice will be brought to them, and we shall be doing everything in our power to ensure a fair prosecution for, for, for the crimes that they have committed here. In the meantime, what more can the UK and the West generally do, do, do to help Ukraine? Well, um, I think it was, Pol- it was the Polish president, uh, Andrzej Duda, who said that there, is, there are three things we can do to help Ukrainians right now. That is weapon, weapon and weapon. Unfortunately, that is the biggest thing that we need right now, because what I began with is you have to realize that what you have seen in Bucha is taking place right now as we speak in other towns and villages. And what we need to do is is to, to save as many lives as possible right now. And the only single way to do that is, is by ensuring that Ukrainian army regains control over the whole territory of Ukraine. And, and that is why we have to ask for a weapon to do that. Uh, I believe that Ukrainian army has proven to be one of the strongest army in the world. Uh, I believe uh, that the, the bravery and, and also the professionalism of the Ukrainian army has been proven. And we hope that the whole world will understand that and, and uh, will see that given us weapon, we will actually do the job. Uh, if you look at the data from this war, we have been most successful in destroying Russian tanks. And, and and there was a good reason for that because we we received lots of anti tank web anti tank weapon from from well including from the UK. So what we're asking for are now the anti aircraft weapon, uh, anti ship weapon, uh, long range uh, uh, missiles to hit down Russian artillery that they're using to destroy Mariupol and Kharkiv right now. Uh, if we have that, I'm sure we can stop those atrocities and bring those responsible to justice. It's interesting when you talk about the bravery of the Ukrainian army. I think most people are in the UK incredibly impressed by the bravery of the Ukrainian people generally and the defiance and the solidarity that the country has shown in the face of this invasion. It is a a truly impressive response. I will tell you this. We are surprised ourselves. (laughs) I I mean... I, I love Ukraine, I love the people of Ukraine, but I also recognize that we do have uh, our issues. We do have uh, problems inside the country. Uh, we have been divided on several lines uh, across uh, uh, all the independence. But right now, we are as united as we have never been, like ever. And this is truly amazing. And I think the reason for that is, of course, because this this, this evil that we're dealing with, it, it's just so obvious that this is evil, that, that everyone, regardless of their I don't know, political beliefs, the language they speak, the area they're from, everyone just understand that this is what we are fighting against. And that is why, regardless of, of uh, again, uh, of all the divisions we had that Putin was trying to build on, uh, we are now actually standing united. And uh, I was surprised uh, because Putin was was uh, was promoting this narrative that Ukraine is divided and that the eastern and southern uh, parts of Ukraine are actually very pro-Russian and they want to be part of Russia or you know one way or another uh, be uh, different. And right now, uh, and for some reason, he thought it would be a good idea to promote this this those uh, things like like being closer to Russia. Uh, by by bombing those cities, uh, that makes no sense. But that is what he did, uh, and and that basically just destroyed any sense of uh, I don't know any sense of uh, support for 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 Russia in those regions. Like I myself was born and raised in Kharkiv, which is uh, the second biggest city in the eastern Ukraine, which has been bombed and shelled so heavily by Russians uh, since day one of the war, basically. And uh, I didn't live in Kharkiv for, for, for many years now, since I graduated high school. Uh, but I still have some classmates there. My parents moved out. They live in the Kiev region right now. But we still have many people there. Absolute majority of them speak Russian. And, and they were texting me. Some of the people I haven't been in touch with for years, they were all texting me in Russian, saying, Ina, please tell whoever you can tell that we want to remain Ukraine. 
we are a Ukrainian city and, and we don't want to surrender. We shall keep on fighting. And those messages were in Russian, but they kept on fighting. And, and it's the same in the southern Ukraine, where people are going to the streets to protest, while Russian tanks are on those streets. And they're going there to say that we want to remain Ukraine. We want you out of here. And they're saying that to the Russian soldiers in Russian. And that is something that, that Putin did not predict and he didn't understand. That, that, that yeah, we speak different languages, but we still are part of the same nation. Uh, so, so we are extremely united and people are extremely committed to fighting uh, both in the army, but, but then civilians as well, just because we understand that what we are fighting for our lives, our ways of being, our future, the future of our kids. Uh, there is no future in Russia. There is no future for, for this Russian world. Uh, so, so no one wants to be part of that. And that is why we know what we are fighting for. And that is why everyone is so committed to, to do whatever it takes uh, to, to destroy uh, the Russian army on our territory. Inna, you said that it isn't Putin who is committing these atrocities in villages like Bucha and in other towns and cities across Ukraine. It is, of course, individual soldiers. But how much responsibility for what is going on do you lay at Putin's door? Well, he is responsible, of course, uh, and, and he should be brought to trial or you know, brought to justice one way or another. I surely hope he dies sooner rather than later. Uh, not because I believe that once he's done, uh, the Russian as a state will stop hating Ukraine, will stop trying to destroy us, uh, and will stop being a threat to the whole world. No. Uh, but I do believe that once Putin is gone, uh, then there will be some uh, problems in terms of, of who the next ruler will be. And that will weaken Russia. So for a while those internal struggles will actually make them um, less of a you know, threat to the world. Uh, but uh, so, so I, I understand that he is responsible, but it's not just him. Look at Russian uh, opposition. Many of those who claim to be a liberal opposition, democratic opposition uh, to, uh, to Putin, uh, the majority of them would say that Crimea is a Russian territory. Many of them would be afraid to say that uh, Ukraine needs to be an independent state. And they claim to be a democratic opposition. I mean, not 100% of them, but even Navalny, he never recognized Crimea to be a Ukrainian territory. Uh, so, so, and those are the best ones of them. But if you look at the regular Russians, they love the idea of hating us. They love the idea of destroying us. Uh, and, and, and we can read that on, on the social media. Uh, we can read that, uh, that this this is largely a society that is sick. It's not just Putin. So, so don't be, be you know, don't think too too easily that simply once Putin is gone, everything is is in order. Because no, I, you know, this has yeah. been this has been a really interesting dimension in your conversation because certainly the mainstream narrative here in the UK is that this is Putin's war and that ordinary Russians have no axe to grind with Ukraine. As you describe it, there is a much deeper cultural problem with Russia seeing Ukraine effectively as part of the Russian empire and its people feeling themselves in some way superior to Ukrainians. Is that how you see it? Yeah, exactly. And, and they have superiority slash inferiority complex, which will sound ridiculous, but they still feel extremely angry at us by the fact that Kyiv was founded so much earlier than Moscow. And, and Moscow was actually founded by people who came from Kyiv. Great mistake on our side. We shall never do that again. But, but they're still like annoyed with this fact. Every time they're reminded of this historical fact, which took place like centuries ago, but they're still feeling that this is wrong. And that is why they want Ukraine under their control, just to say that this all is, is, is the ancient truce, which was called at the time. So, so this is like superiority slash inferiority complex that they're trying to deal with. But uh, it, is, it is extremely strong, and those feelings are extremely strong. And, and also you shouldn't undermine uh, the level of, of hatred average Russians are feeling, not just towards Ukrainians, but also towards the West, there is this anti-Western hysteria in Russia, 
they're claiming that that, uh, that the Western culture is is terrible, that uh, it is all about LGBTQ rights and, and gay parades. This is so much part of the Russian culture that uh, actually the, the head of the Russian uh, church claimed that the war in Ukraine has is, is justified and sane because uh, they need to stop gay parades from happening in Ukraine, just like this has been taking place in the Western Europe. So, so you have to understand this is this is the revolt not just against uh, this is not the war of one person. This is the revolt of the whole society against uh, modern, uh, well, progressive values or just well, mere respect for human rights for that matter. They truly hate that. They 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 are like very much against that. So it's not yeah, we, we have the phrase yeah. in the UK and in the West, culture wars. You know, I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with that, mm-hmm. but you're suggesting that the culture wars that have been invoked over here by conservative MPs, people like Boris Johnson, people like Donald Trump in the United States, and of course are capitalised upon by Vladimir Putin in Russia, you're suggesting that these are deeply held values by Russian people, not just values that that Putin has mobilised for a temporary period. Yeah, it is. They they are uh, truly believing in many of those things. And the Russian church is playing a great role in that. You have to realize that. So so they are, uh, of course, Putin, again, has been capitalizing on that. Like his hatred toward gays was not as prominent in the beginning of his rule as it was starting from uh, 2012 or somewhere around that time. Uh, So so he is using those uh, culture wars uh, to, to, you know, to gain control, to gain power. Uh, but it is also part of the larger tradition of, of the of the Russian people. So don't be fooled by the idea of the great Russian culture. I think this is a big strain of thought in, in let's say, France, for instance, where they be, they believe that there is great Russian culture, ballet and all. Well, 99% of Russians are not into that. 99% of Russians believe in, 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 in things which we would believe uh, to be medieval and, and uh, uh, terrifying. Uh, do you know that in Russia it is not, actually believed to be a crime when a husband beats his wife. And there were huge discussions about that, and they voted against that specifically. So it's not like, like they claim that this is part of the Russian tradition, to beat your wife. So then when Russian soldiers are coming here to Ukrainian territory and are raping Ukrainian women, Russian women don't see a problem in that because that is part of their culture. That is the Russian culture, not ballet and Dostoevsky and all of that. In a, I'm conscious that you promised us half an hour of your time and you've given us that. It would be great if you stayed on and listened to the conversation, joined in a little further, maybe took a question or two, but equally, if you need to go, I know it's family time and you've got your son, it's entirely up to you. But I'm going to bring in a few other voices now, but if you do want to hang around and join in with our conversation. I think I, have, I, think I would have like 10 minutes. Yeah. And I have to, yep. Uh, no, that's okay. understood. Let, let's bring in Peter Jukes, who's the executive editor of Byline Times. Peter, you've been listening very patiently to you know, some very fascinating insights into Russia and into the struggle of the Ukrainian people at the moment. I could listen to you know, all day. And I've only been to Ukraine um, eight years ago. But what an amazing culture. And she's a living example of why it is a symbol now for all of us of democracy and bravery in the face of defending democracy and pluralism and all these rights she talks about. You must remember, I mean, I'll talk a moment, just as a journalist, by the way, just as a journalist, everything Inna has said is provable. The shaving of the heads of female captured prisoners of war, the mass migration, forced labor of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians from the Donbass and Mar- Mariupol. Um, the, uh, we're seeing devastation, Borodyanka, these villages around, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Kiev towards Cherniv. I mean, Buka, unfortunately, may just be the tip of the iceberg. Everything she says is factually proven. So as a journalist, I can say she says the truth. As a human being, I must say what we're witnessing is crimes against humanity. You know, uh, Ukrainians are humans. And when we see those pictures, we respond as humans, as Europeans, but as humans. So this is, as she says, the fight of our century. As you know, on Byline Times, we've been seeing this coming 
for a long while. Uh, the only other thing I'd observe is this fascinating, you know, interaction between a powerful, strong man and the sort of racist, xenophobic elements of a culture. And in many ways, since the 90s, we've seen a Weimar Germany. We've seen a, a Weimar Russia, rather, in uh, it, you know, like Weimar Germany, in that the country went through massive economic changes. It never really addressed its failures in the Cold War, never really addressed Stalinism, just like 1930s Germany didn't. And is living under this big lie. And the big lie is they won the war, you know, alone from 41 to 45 by killing Nazis in the West. And of course, for two years, Stalin worked alongside uh, Hitler with the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact, which is now unteachable in Russian schools or society to carve up uh, Lithuania, Poland, and Ukraine. So we're we're witnessing a culture which has these atavistic elements, which then, whether Putin's captured by the culture or he's captured the culture, it's difficult to know. But Inner is truly right in that, you know, when you see these people celebrating their phone calls intercepted between Russian soldiers and their partners and their parents back home, there was one say I had to one soldier apparently and it's, it's verifiable said to his mother i had to um shoot a, a young boy and an old man and she said don't worry sweetie they're fascists they deserve it the power of that propaganda is up there with judith Stryker, who was behind this Sturmer. he was hanged at nuremberg for war crimes because of the anti-Semitism he promoted. The indictments in Rwanda against the radio station Radio Mila Colleen, which called uh, Tutsis cockroaches. I think that these war crimes are on a par with genocide. Whether you can prove it as a, you know, who is deliberately, you can prove a commander left his troops to kill people in Bukha. You can prove that, that you know, various crimes against humanity, shelling hospitals are done by a artillery or, you know, a artillery unit. Genocide is a higher level of proof. But from all I'm saying, from that Novosti, we have Novosti article, which in a site, there is a genocidal justification and TV hosts are asking the Russian army to do more, to kill more. It's terrifying. Mm. In a, the Russian troops have been told that the Ukrainians are Nazis, and Peter touched on this, the idea that they are on a mission to denazify Ukraine. And given the sacrifice that the Russian people made in World War II and the horrors inflicted on both Russia and Ukraine – in World War Two, of course, Ukraine is not a Nazi country. But I mean, effectively, we're saying, aren't we, that these people have been brainwashed? That the troops have been told this big lie. Does that give them any excuse, any wiggle room? Do you think? Well, uh, well first of all, sorry, I was just. Uh I, I got a message from my team uh, about a six-year-old boy who uh, everyone was looking for him uh, because he got lost with his family and they just reported that he was found dead and he was uh, shot by Russians. So not a missile or something. They yeah. they saw a six-year-old child and they killed him. Uh, and and this is just yet another piece of news that I just read this, like, like literally right now, uh, that we are seeing. Uh, and... I'm sorry, there is no excuse for that. No single excuse. And we are getting, like, and, and you should read Russian publics and Russian social media. they all saying we want more. They forget, like, I can't understand how is that possible. I can't understand how human beings can be as cruel. I can't explain how people who claim to be survivors of Nazism can become a Nazi state. But this has actually become true. So, so this is unfortunately uh, the reality today. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah and let me just be clear. Also, I, mean, I wasn't seeking to in any way minimise the awful tragedy being visited upon Ukraine. But, you know, it's just a question around, you know, if people believe that they are confronting Nazis. But, of course, that would never in any event justify killing no, a six-year-old boy, you know. No. You know what? We've been having those debates with, with my friends and, and my team uh, a lot. Like, do they understand what they're doing? Mm. And the consensus is that they do understand what they're doing. They are aware of that. But they, yeah, they have been brainwashed. But they also, I still believe in, in, in individual responsibility for one's uh, actions. Yes. And you can be brainwashed, but, but you have to remain human, right? And, and you can be brainwashed, but you have to be able to look at the mere facts that six-year-old can't be Nazis by definition. Uh, so, so this is as bad as it is. But I will, I will add, like on the, on the other on the second note, I will add just two more comments because the, this Nazi debate has has been strong, and I just want to point out to several issues, uh, particularly about Azov Battalion, because there yes. were many many issues about that, so I just want to clarify some things. And for people well, who if, don't know, you know, let me just clarify, the Azov Battalion is a very strongly nationalistic group within Ukraine who have been accused of being neo-Nazis. Precisely. And uh, before I say that, I will point out that I'm proud to have been called the Member of Parliament most friendly to LGBTQ community. I'm very active on feminist issues and very supportive of LGBTQ rights. Uh, so, so when I'm saying that they are not Nazis, that is coming from, from the point of view of, pe of a person who, is, who has her reputation. And, and, and I'm upholding that reputation. LGBTQ groups have been providing funding to Azov Battalion because they know that the, the, any radical right elements that have been there in the beginning, maybe in 2014, as of now, have been gone, or they changed their their position, or they, you know. So, so if LGBTQ organizations are funding as of, you can be absolutely sure that they are not neo Nazis. Do they have some radical elements? Well, maybe, but but those are not the neo Nazis that that the Russians are trying are claiming them to be. But Russians claim anyone who speaks Ukrainian to be a Nazi. When they are speaking about, in this article that, that Peter also was referring to, when they were saying that uh, we need to denazify Ukraine, in this article they're using two other words, uh, which they use synonymously. The second word being de-Ukrainize, de -Ukraine, I'm not sure that, that how to use this in English, uh, like de-Ukrainize Yes, yes stop, it, stop Ukraine. Stop it, Ukraine. Stop being yeah, the, the yeah. Ukrainian elements of Ukraine, the things exactly. that make it distinctively Ukrainian, yeah. Precisely. And the second word they're using is de-Europeanized Ukraine. And then they also claim that the very word Ukraine should be forgotten and not be used. So, so you have to realize when they're speaking about Nazi, anyone who speaks Ukrainian is a Nazi to them. This is their understanding of Nazi. So again, I'm not saying that there were no radical elements in Azov, but claiming that they're a neo-Nazi group just because what they're doing now is protecting a city of Mariupol, a Russian-speaking city, with 90% actually of Azov Battalion being Russian speakers, claiming that they're a neo-Nazi group, that is just ridiculous at this point. Again, they did have radical elements in 2014. But as of right now, it's a completely different organization. It's just a very strong uh, military unit uh, with very strong training. And, and they're just a military unit. They are not presenting any ideology for that matter right now. They're just part of the army. So, so there is no ideological like, like reason in why this, uh, for, for this regiment. They're just part of the general forces of Ukraine without representing any specific ideology. And if you look at the pol 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 political side of that, the most, uh, like, um, call it right-wing group in the Ukrainian uh, politics, uh, they didn't get into parliament during 2019 elections, and they got something around 1.5% of the votes of the people. Those were the most, like, like radical right that we got. They didn't even get into parliament. So that is, again, for you to understand to what extent radical right ideas are present here in Ukraine. Again, that doesn't mean we are perfect. 
we still have issues with LGBT rights, with, with the women's rights. You know, I still can talk a lot about that, being a very liberal and progressive member of parliament. But, but it's, it's nothing close to what Russia is describing, not even close. And they have no way, uh, you know, the authority to be speaking about who is Nazi and who is not them being yes. the most and, Nazi and, state and, of the and, world. And, and, and Inna, I was reading some of your party's policies and your manifestos today. And, you know, you have complaints about oligarchs, uh, yeah. as, as we do in the UK, about Russian oligarchs operating in the UK. But you've got your own oligarchs. You complain about corruption in Ukraine. But I suppose there is a level of these things which in a normal, healthy democracy, you can debate, you can discuss, you can expose. And that was the situation in Ukraine before this invasion. There were people in public life who you did not like, who you disagreed with publicly, but you were able to have the debate and stand for parliament to oppose those people. That's the nature of of democracy yeah, and precisely. it's around that idea it seems to me that ukraine really has rallied as a nation and said whether you believe this or you believe that we all believe in this fundamental tenet of being able to get rid of our rulers if we don't like them yeah precisely and that is uh, why putin is so scared of us because he doesn't want to set an example for the Russian people, that they can have the luxury of actually choosing who will be running them. Uh, he doesn't want uh, Russian people to be saying that they don't like the oligarchs. I mean, I don't like the oligarchs here, too. I have, again, many issues with, with the oligarchs, with the corruption. But I'm willing to fight against that in an independent state of Ukraine. And that is what we are fighting for right now. And on that note, I'm sorry that now I will unfortunately have to leave because I have yet another interview to do. <laughs> so Inna, it would be great to speak to you again. It's It's been amazing to speak to you today. Thank you so much and good luck and please stay safe. And we stand, Thank you so much. as I've said before, we stand in solidarity with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. That's Inna Sovson. Wow, Peter Dukes. <laughs> what a thing, isn't it? Hey? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to just so we're going to have to get a transcript of that and put it in the next edition of Byline Times. I see our editor Hardeep is listening. What an amazing woman. What an amazing culture. I mean, I think the thing is we, as you know, journalists, we have great reporters, the BBC out there. But we intermediate. We have people telling us what these cultures are like. My brief experience of Ukraine and everything I've seen about it in the last eight, year, eight years has shown me that it's full of people like Inna. And, you know, it is our lives, our future, our democracy, which is actually on the line here, there, that they're, they're shedding blood for, their children are dying for. Because we see other autocrats watching Putin, whether in China or in India or Brazil, um, and saying what can autocrats get away with because democracy is inconvenient, it's messy, you have to argue over rights, you have uncertainty, you have suddenly have to deal with pluralism, different points of view. And Russia, which had that moment in the 90s, there's a great writer who hardly also I know who's listening, really great, where she won a Nobel Prize, this author, so we, a lot of people rate her. Svetlana Alexeyevich, a Belarusian author, Secondhand Time, which describes what happened to the Russian, mainly Russian mind, by the way, because people, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, and it was that turning point from the future to resentment, anger, the past, we're betrayed. Things were better then. We have this extraordinary spectacle of the babushkas, the older women, really it's extraordinary it's very unlike during afghanistan inciting their boys to go and fight there to go and kill there to go and die there and we have a society in terminal demographic decline and focused on its past glories to the point that it will drag other people down just to make itself better if you see what is extraordinary to me and i can't quite comprehend it at a, at, there's no rational way i comprehend it but you get an emotional level. So the Russian army, the Rosgardia, invaded large tracts of um, northwest and uh, northeast and northern Ukraine in an attempt to take over the country and decapitated it. It got stalled. It was held back. But this country, 
they wanted to liberate, or if you see what's happened in the southeast in Mariupol, this beautiful city on the on the Black Sea, which they besieged. This country they wanted to, to take over, denazify, they just destroyed it. They did, you know, this is not saying, let's take over a country and make them think Russian and take, you know, and they'll contribute to our culture. They just wanted to loot, unfortunately, rape, which is a tool of war, and rob and kill uh, in order to drag another nation down, which was doing better than them, because Ukraine was doing better than them. Ukraine, that wasn't part of the EU, wanted to be part of the EU. That's the reason why the Maidan revolution happened. Was, you know, the life standards are better. It's still lower than Poland, because they're not part of the EU. But And there's enormous, I think, and it made this point, there's also enormous resentment that it's done so well that it's existentially threatening to the Putinist, the Russian way of being, because by going through democracy and pluralism and an open economy, not completely dominated by oligarchs, everybody's happier. And that just immiserates, and obviously immiserated the soldiers who arrived there, who wanted to kill and take their eye. We've tracked, we've tracked the sort of stuff they sold back to, or posted back from Belarus as these troops returned, people still have their tracking on their earphones and their iPads, and they're all turning up in Moscow, or other parts in Russia. It is a terrible indictment of the, the opposite. It's just a, I don't know what it's called. It's like a zero sum game to race to the bottom is the only way you can feel better is by dragging other people down, destroying their neighborhoods, destroying zoos, hospitals, kindergartens. Uh, and, you know, this is a this kind of mentality is a threat to all of us, and it must be stopped. Let's get a word or two from our listeners. Just to remind you before we do that you're listening, if you're listening live to Byline Radio, or maybe on catch-up to the Byline Times podcast. And we come from... The Byline Times. If you don't know what that is, well, it's an independent news outlet based in the UK reporting without fear or favour. How come? Well, we don't have a proprietor backing us. We don't have any oligarchs or corporate interests telling us what to say or what to think. We are funded by ordinary people like you. So if you believe in what we're doing, go and check our website, bylinetimes.com. That's where you'll find details of how to subscribe to our brilliant monthly newspaper, which is edited by Hardeep Matharu, who I know is listening. And you get your paper, you're supporting Byline Radio, the Byline Times podcast, Byline TV as well, all that for one measly £39 a year subscription to our brilliant paper. So go check out bylinetimes.com, our wonderful news-breaking website, and that's where you'll find out how to subscribe to the Byline Times. Um, let's see if I can allow uh, Cesar, I think it is, into the conversation. Cesar, hello. Um, welcome. I think I was just connecting. Might take a moment. Hello, Cesar. Welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Yay. Loud and clear, Cesar. Yeah. What did you want to say on Byline Radio? Well, so um, over the past over the past two and a half years, um, I've been working in the EU and never have I seen such a coordinated and focused effort um, towards, you know, uh, supporting Ukraine. And I have to say, uh, thank you very much for like hosting this space. It is, uh, you know, the accounts from from Nina was a uh, truly uh, touching to say the least um, and of course we have many issues within uh, within Europe there's many different countries trying to figure out how to respond to this uh, this onslaught on Ukraine um, but it is really it's been a unifying force uh, for the European Union it's been a unifying force for NATO. Um, and I actually am living in an apartment now hosting two Ukrainian families. So the war in Brussels, I guess you can say, you know, is, is being felt. Um, I had a question actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who it's best pointed towards, but it's kind of a little bit towards the, uh, the rationale behind this invasion of Ukraine, um, we hear from the Kremlin constantly this uh, narrative around NATO, around Western expansionism, um, you know, NATO, which in its constitution is a defensive pact. It says it, you know, very clearly. 
So I think the question kind of really goes uh, along the lines of what is Putin so scared of? Is it indeed this kind of NATO threat, which is what we hear a lot from the Kremlin? Or is it in fact this more democratic threat where Ukraine as a free independent nation maybe wants to turn more westward, turn more democratic, embrace some of the values that we've just heard, you know, LGBT rights, um, these types of liberal values. Uh, I was just wondering if anyone had a, had an opinion as to kind of beyond or underneath the propaganda machine of this kind of anti-NATO sentiment. Is there actually just a fear for democracy in Russia? Peter. Yeah, unfortunately, having this thing again where you're going to have to summarise the question because it muted uh, the question for me, uh, Adrian. So yeah, no, well, a... Cesar was saying, Cesar, uh, do you want me to do it or do you want to do it in brief yourself? I can do it very brief. I can't hear it. it it's so oh, yeah, I say. see, I see, Peter. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So Cesar was saying that, uh, is it, is Russia motivated by a fear of NATO, which is often claimed by supporters of Russia, mm. or is it actually the fear of democracy, the model that Ukraine represents on its border that really frightens Putin? Is that why he's invaded? Yeah, I think that I think the latter is more likely, isn't it? I mean, if you want to do anything to increase uh, NATO membership, as we're seeing with Finland and Sweden, this uh, does it. There's a deeper. I, mean, I can see why. You know, Russia, by the way, almost joined NATO in 2000 because it's a mutual. It's not an aggressive organization, though. You know, obviously, it, it did conduct airstrikes in uh, Bosnia against the uh, Serb positions outside Sarajevo after a four-year siege, and it was involved in Afghanistan and under the sort of joint protection, the Article Five, I think it is, which if one of members attacked, we defend all members, and they, you know, NATO was involved in the strikes against. Bin Laden. But generally, it's it's not an aggressive organization. It's a mutual defense pact. And there's a lot of kind of, understandably, because of the Cold War, a lot of rhetoric, oh, that's NATO, it's a Western imperialist alliance. I, I do get that, maybe had elements of that. But I think in this point, out, hasn't it? And this thing about Ukrainians, you know, they have these horrible words for them. I won't repeat them. They have these sort of names for Ukrainians. But it's like, imagine all the worst English prejudice against the Irish, against the Scots, against the Welsh, maybe against Indians as well. That is roped into that culture. And, 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 and the same resentment, you know, some less than so now, but Brits used to fill up against America doing better. You're rolling in a whole load of prejudices, which when it comes to shooting a six-year-old kid, they're not going, you're going to join NATO. You're going, you don't deserve to exist. I think that's much more powerful. Cesar, thank you very much indeed for joining in. Let's get a word with Jane Morrison, who's joining Byline Radio. Hello, Jane. Hello, thank you. I've just happened upon you and um, I'm, I'm very interested in this because I've got a question. I'm from Northern Ireland and was involved in the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition in the Good Friday Agreement times. So um, that's my background. But um, I can't understand why the UN can't send in its peacekeeping forces. Uh, now, I know that the argument is that Russia has a veto and, and that China might not support it, but does that really matter? I mean, why? where are the blue hats, the blue whatever they call them, peace, peacekeeping forces going in to help out? Why can that not be done? Mm, well, that's a good question, but I suspect you may already have uh, had the answer uh, yourself, really, there, Jane. Peter, Jane wants to know why the United Nations can't send in a peacekeeping force, uh, albeit that she acknowledges that Russia itself, of course, wouldn't support it as a member of the Security Council, kind of the, the inner chamber of the UN, and China quite probably wouldn't support it as well either, which I suspect makes it very difficult for the UN to add, because it, it, it only has as many peacekeepers as it is allowed to have by its key member states and also it's not keeping the peace now is it let's be clear there's no peace to be kept the only way a peacekeeping force could come in is if the ukrainians basically surrendered 
and Russia agree to down arms and 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 keep its own territorial claims, keep you know Mariupol, uh, those other cities in the south, Kherson, Kherson. Um, and would Ukraine accept that? This is. I was having a debate with a pacifist today on, online about this, and I always this goes back to my. I was always thought I was a bit of a pacifist against war, and I realised it really, really. And we all have seen images of violence to a shocking degree, which is very traumatising. And I have journalists there who've seen them in the flesh, the people who went through it, the relatives there. But we're all partially traumatised, traumatised um, vicariously. Is that how do you stop violence? And I remember this dilemma around the Serb guns for four years, around Sarajevo, 10,000 people killed alone in Sarajevo, 100,000 Bosnians, mainly civilians killed during the Bosnian War, mainly because they didn't have arms against the very well-armed Bosnian Serbs who basically took over the old Yugoslav army. And I sometimes think you need violence to stop violence, fire to fight fire. The only reason there aren't more dead across Ukraine is that the Ukrainian army fought the Russian army to a standstill in the northwest outside Kiev. Otherwise, who knows what would happen. And the peacekeeping, there's no peace to be cooked kept at the moment what the russians need to be do at, what the, what the Russian, what happened needs to happen to russia what the ukrainians need to do with our support is defeat this kind of civilian targeted indiscriminate warfare which basically targets the people whether that's genocide or not but you can see from all those cities they've just destroyed the houses you know I know Americans did really bad things in Iraq and Afghanistan. There were war crimes committed. And there were villages and towns like Fallujah bombed. But I never sensed a complete attitude of destruction towards all Afghanistan and all Iraqis. And that's what we're seeing here. So we will not keep the peace for our children and our grandchildren. I'm a grandfather now. I can actually say that. Or anybody, if this kind of warfare, this kind of racist, unprovoked war of aggression, because there's no provocation in it, none whatsoever. You know, whatever you think of the provocations of Saddam Hussein or the Taliban, there were some. Maybe it didn't, it, you can say it didn't justify those wars, absolutely, but there were some provocations. We have to, for the sake of peace, um, uh, stop this, and then we can peace keep. Can I can I just come in and then say what about protection of the civilians? Surely the world has a duty to send in people, whether they be the the UN forces or uh, or just to, to, to protect the civilians. I mean, sh- surely that could be the role of a peacekeeping force, uh, yeah, but, humanitarian. Uh, role. J- Jane, I think it's a, it's a really interesting thought. I, I suspect that if any nation other than Ukraine had troops on Ukrainian soil in order to defend the Ukrainian people, merely to protect them, as you describe it, my sense is that Russia would regard that as provocation and we might see an escalation in the same way that NATO has resisted calls from within Ukraine to enforce a no-fly zone in Ukraine because that would be seen as a provocation that might then escalate into World War Three. The concern would be that any peacekeeping force might be seen as, even if the troops were not from a NATO country, though it's hard to imagine where they might be provided from if it were not from a a NATO country. I certainly can't imagine them being provided, say, by China. Uh, That would be very interesting. But if the the troops were provided by any NATO country, that would be regarded as a provocation, and I think in an act of war by Putin. And even if they were not provided by a NATO country, I also think it would be regarded as an act of war, even if it were possible. But, I mean, I, I hear your anguish because... You want to see ordinary people who have not committed any acts of aggression protected exactly. from the aggression. Yes, yes. And, and, and what force is out there to, to do that? I don't even want to use the word force. I want I want the humanitarian help. I mean, I know the Red Cross have been in doing it, but there must be a larger, maybe the peacekeepers from the UN could find a new role. And and, and if, if they go in, 
with uh, large numbers of bl- blue hats, surely that being them being attacked uh, will be another great example of of what Putin's up to, you know, I don't know. Sorry, sorry, I, you can see, as everyone I'm sure on this feels, the, the terrible, terrible anguish and the hopelessness, which makes us all feel very, very frustrated. Oh, listen, Jan, we've seen, I mean, we've heard tonight from uh, Inner talking about a six-year-old boy being shot dead. We've yeah. seen pictures of people in drains. I don't want to even repeat some of the things that people will have seen in photographs on social media, photographs which the Russians say are staged but which satellite imagery demonstrates this was happening before the russians even left towns like bukar you you know there's, there's no question in my mind that these are genuine appalling atrocities and i think we're all moved and frustrated and angry and and wish there was a way a more practical way that we could we could help people but listen it's been great to hear from you thank you uh, for joining in. Let's speak to Sabman. Hello, Sabman. Welcome to Byline Radio. Hi, thank you so much for uh, uh, taking this. And uh, I missed the earlier part, but uh, I wanted to ask if um, if the only way to um, to fight force is by force, uh, then um, the, the sort of the few... <laughs> sorry about it. <laughs> My dog. Uh, when the only way to uh, if the the sort of the conclusion that leads to if you think it through is that either the war continues and simmers away and it lasts several years, um, uh, in which in which time Russia I mean Russia already is seeing uh, its ruble return to its uh, re- pre-war uh, value, its economy is starting to stabilize. And it's just, it, it, I think time is on, time, longer time is on, it's not on the side of Ukraine, right? It's on the side of Russia from what I can see. So um, if, if that is the case and, and uh, the conclusion I seem to come to is that eventually you're going to have to confront Russia by force. So what is, what is the calculus in terms of just delaying that? Mm, uh, interesting one. So, Peter, I don't know if you heard what Sabman said, but that saying that, that uh, effectively, if we don't confront Russia with force, perhaps at a greater level than we're seeing uh, at, at the moment, the odds obviously favour Russia. And he mentioned that the fact that its economy appears to be sta- de- to be stabilising again, uh, mm. despite the the sanctions and so mm. on I- administered by Western countries. I think it's a close call. Um, so, I mean, I am no expert, by the way, but I spend a lot of time with the experts and checking them out and seeing their predictions and seeing how it plays out. The ones who rightly predicted, which I sense but can't say why, that the maximalist plan to take over Ukraine, decapitate it, de- you know, take over Kiev, install a government in a few days, invade Odessa, that the ones who rightly called that are saying it's going to be difficult for Russia to take, to move its new minimalist objectives, which is basically create a corridor from the Crimea uh, right across to, it's called Novi Ras- Novorossiya. It's the eastern part of Donbass across the southern coast, including Mariupol, maybe including Odessa. They'd love to cut off Ukraine from the Black Sea. Their new strategy is basically to create this land, but of stuff they have invaded now, basically, which takes them up to Kherson, almost in uh, up to almost within reach of Mikhailov and then across towards Zaporozhye where the nuclear power station is and that basically even though Mariupol is still standing um would mean that there was a land route all the way to Crimea now the problem is those units which have retreated from uh those BTGs, battle tactical groups, battalion tactical groups that retreated from Kiev and Cherniv are in very bad shape. And they've got to move them all the way around the country. Meanwhile, though Ukraine has suffered significant losses, their army, they have captured quite a lot of tanks. They've kept a lot of their own tanks. Therefore, still seems to be, you know, there's no air supremacy for the Russians. They can move quicker towards where they're trying to come through Sumy and sort of come through Kharkiv. This is Kharkiv, the city in, uh, was brought up in 
in the northeast, very close to the Russian border, and sort of cut the army off that and cut. There's a like a trench system, like the you know World War One in Flanders. There's a trench system between dividing Donbass between the eastern and western, between the Russian control part and the Ukrainian, and they're trying to come around the back of that. Now the question is: Is there? enough there's a there's the morale these people are fighting for their lives they've seen their relatives killed they've been digging out bodies from children's sand pits they want to fight but you know do they have the heavy weaponry the anti-air um you know defenses uh big tanks and big guns to be able to take on a concerted push and that i don't know i mean i would think that russia has overestimated its military capacity so far in the last month or more. Um, the morale of Russians is suffering. There are conscripts. It's illegal, but they are sending conscripts. It shouldn't happen. They are depleted. They've lost a lot of generals and senior staff and their military hardware. But, you know, this is where we've all got to push. And I'm afraid, you know, somebody doesn't like violence. This is where we've got to push for top air defense systems for them the czech republic are sending over tanks they don't seem very sophisticated tanks and every assistance on the intelligence side aerial reconnaissance everything we can do without starting world war three to make ukraine defeat russia because that's by far the best outcome that will humiliate russia that will humiliate putin that will this small neighbor a country it's not really a country it's a chicken it's a chicken a bird if it doesn't fly which is a famous russian phrase they say about poland and ukraine it's not really a nation if that defeats them well, then that's a slap in the face. That's a lesson from history. These imperial grandiose ambitions don't work, but it's touching there. Mm. Uh, Sadman, on your analysis, either Ukraine will be beaten by Russia or uh, Ukraine will fight back, but it won't have a, a an ultimate victory against Russia without outside assistance and and that of course could trigger a greater conflagration is is that your underlying concern i i have two concerns i have one is that uh well i think one concern may be based on ignorance because i think i don't know enough about what is going, what is what the, how the europeans and natos are helping ukraine uh because and and I, that's good because i i hope they're doing more than what is publicized um and that is my hope. And, and uh, but if that is n- not the case, then the economic sanctions are, don't seem to be enough. And, and I don't think. In, in fact, I'm in Berlin. I'm in Germany, and I don't. I don't even think the Germans are sincere about that. Just, just sadly, um, it, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm so disappointed in the German uh, um, state that uh, to, it's it's just a shame. It's shameful. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I think the, the, either the sanctions have to be really sincere to the point where it, it costs us just as much. I mean, the sincere sanctions mean we take a brunt. We uh, we have to have cold nights. We have to have um, uh, reduce our GDP. Um, and that hasn't happened. And I don't I don't know if there's the will to do that. Um and on the other side, the, the, there's the military option, um, w- which, um, yeah, could could spark a greater war in Europe. Um, and, and the other option is, yeah, making sure that the Ukrainians have more than enough to defeat, to, to categorically defeat uh, Russia and I, I don't even know if that is happening. So that's that's yeah. my concern. And, and, and I mean, Germany is, I suppose, compromised. I think partly compromised by its post-war history and its kind of lack of desire to become in, embroiled in military adventures, and uh, understandable, perhaps, given its history. Uh, but it also is compromised by its reliance on Russian energy, isn't it? And it has cancelled now the Nord Stream two pipeline, but. For many years, Germany believed that building closer ties with Russia was the solution to bringing Russia on side. And 
encouraging it to embrace Western values and so on. And with hindsight, that now looks very sadly mistaken, but I believe that was the the motivation. I saw some analysis today which suggested that if Europe simply cut off all energy from Russia, that might well make life more difficult for European countries, and particularly for Europe, but it might only hit GDP by 1%. So there would be a hit, and that's the kind of hit that you're talking about, but it, it, it would be manageable by the relatively wealthy countries of Western Europe. I think Cesar, who is in uh, – I think you're in Brussels, are you, Cesar? You, you wanted to make a comment on this, I think. Yeah, just a quick uh, – just a very, very quick comment, if I can, on that. Uh, of course, I'm speaking completely in uh, in my personal capacity. I just have to outline that to uh, to start off with. But uh, but interestingly enough, we've seen some uh, we've seen some quite unique developments actually happening not only on the sanction fronts towards Russia, but actually also within the European Union itself. So I don't know if uh, if any of the listeners have been following the elections uh, in Hungary, but the Fidesz party, which is the was the ruling party, is now again the ruling party led by Viktor Orbán, um, is seen to kind of be um, Putin's, you know, uh, I, I don't know how to put this politely, kind of friendly, friendly idiot within Europe. That's kind of how he's generally seen. And the EU has actually started now to slash funds to Hungary uh, over these supposed uh, rule of law breaches, which has been an ongoing debate for quite a while. So, just uh, just on the sanctions front, uh, on the EU level, just to kind of, you know, just bring that other kind of dynamic into it. Not only are we seeing, you know, unprecedented sanctions against uh, against Russia, which I totally would agree with uh, with Sabman. You know, we could go much further in Europe than we are. We could take the example of Lithuania that has recently, uh, you know, decided to give a, a first EU member to completely give up Russian gas. Um, but actually, you know, we are seeing almost quasi sanctions within Europe itself to try to undermine some of these self-proclaimed illiberal Democrats. So yes, and you, your, you, your disclaimer was because you do work for the EU, uh, for the EU Commission, but you're, as you say, you're talking in a personal capacity and you've just joined in uh, the conversation as a citizen, as it were. So thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Sabman, for making some interesting points. Thanks to Jane as well. And thanks to everybody who has raised points and joined in what I think has been a pretty intelligent and moving conversation, certainly the earlier part with Inner as well. And there are articles about all sorts of aspects of the Russian invasion of Ukraine over at bylinetimes.com as well. There's been a wealth of writing, Peter, from our from our team of writers all over the world, people contributing in so many different ways because it's, it, it's important and it, it's horribly fascinating as well. We never forget that there are real people at the heart of this who in some cases are sadly losing their lives. Yeah, it's we have at least seven or eight journalists or you know not full time for us who are writing for us from ukraine we have an amazing russian writer who used to write for the Novaya gazeta who we're translating in order because that organization has had to shut down under uh, putin's draconian laws about reporting the special operation yeah it is a i mean a crisis of our times i'm amazed how this has cut through I, how you know uh, Inna was talking about, you know, she's an opposition party leader. She's not on the same party as Zelensky, but they've united. And even I can say that whatever I think about Boris Johnson, his immigration um, tactics, his campaign Brexit to Ukraine, and the ridiculous things he does, most of the British society, the Ministry of Defence, most MPs have rallied around in quite an amazing way. And sometimes it takes things horrible, horrible horrific um, atrocities like we've seen and the war of aggression like we've seen to unite us. And, you know, maybe there's some hope for the future there. Peter, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much as well to Inna Sovson, who is the deputy head of the Golosh Shmin party. That means the voice party. She's a former minister as well and just gave us an incredible 
on the ground insight from Ukraine. Really grateful to Inna and hopefully we'll be able to speak to her again. Thank you, as I say, to Peter, to everybody who's taken part. And you can read all of those great writers and so many different articles that Peter mentioned to get some real insight into the Russian invasion of Ukraine over at our website, bylinetimes.com. And that is also where you find details of how to subscribe to our monthly newspaper, The Byline Times. And those subscriptions help sustain the website, Byline Radio, Byline Times podcast, and Byline TV. So you really do get good value for your money. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Solidarity with the people in Ukraine fighting back against the invasion. We'll be back again soon. Uh, Stay tuned to at Byline Radio for more Twitter space conversations or subscribe free to the Byline Times podcast and you won't miss a thing. Thanks very much indeed for listening. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now.